morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Whatever time you're watching this, it's uh, Saturday for me, uh, and I'm going to be posting up these videos for AP Stats. So this is our first videos looking at Chapter 1, which is how we collect data, analyzing data, and so forth. So we're going to start with Section 1 um, in Chapter 1, which is dealing with categorical data. So I'm going to hop over to the board, and we'll start to look at, in this video particularly, uh, the difference between bar graphs and pie charts. So let's flip on over to the board. Okay, so <clears throat> first thing to um, kind of keep in mind is, is categorical data. So categorical data is going to be data that is not or cannot be numerically expressed. So examples could be stuff like color, or we could say um, music, genre, um, favorite state, you know, stuff like that. Things that cannot be expressed as numbers. Non So when we are getting information that is deemed categorical data, we want to think about how do we express information or come to decisions based on that kind of data. So one way that we uh, analyze and present that data is through the use of graphs. So there are two main graphs um, they're not the only types of graphs, but there are two main graphs that we will look at here in the course, and that are, sorry, and that is bar graphs, and then there are pie charts. So you might be familiar with these already. I would hope that you're familiar with these already. Uh, pie charts are typically a circle graph, right? And we might have collected, so let's say we go around and we collect, um, you know, we go into a particular uh, class. So let's say we go into the senior class at PTS and we start to collect what their um, choices are, in, or sorry, or what their final grades are for junior year. So we go into senior class and we go, okay, let's collect percentages on final grade. junior year. So obviously there are four options. Maybe they got an A, a B, a C, a D, and oh, God forbid, maybe somebody got an F. All right. But those are all the options that exist. So then we would get counts and we might say, okay, there's a senior class. Let's just say for our example, to keep it simple, there's a hundred seniors. Okay, and I'm going to write how many of the seniors got each of these. So let's say um, 40 of the seniors got an A, then we had 30 got a B, um, 20 got a C, so that's already 70, 80, 90, and let's say 6 got a D, and then finally 4 special seniors got an F. So in making the pie chart, obviously the pie would represent the whole. So then each of these would be a percentage of that whole. So in making the pie chart, and here it's going to be a little hard to do because I, since 40%. So this right here, you'd have to represent it as part of the pie chart. So let's say this represents the A, then 30% would be a little smaller sliver of that. So let's say that's this it would be B. C would be something like this. And then D and F. So this is me kind of doing it by hand. But what I want you to kind of keep in mind is in doing a pie chart, it is difficult 
or it's a little bit harder for us to make the actual graph. And what you will be asked sometimes to do during the exam is to construct an actual graph. So making a pie chart, if you decide to represent the data as a pie chart, is difficult to do by hand. This is why we have software that kind of does it. Now, we could have put all this information into something like Excel or Google Sheets and have it create for us the pie chart based on the numbers. And that's what typically most people do nowadays. Um, but to do it by hand, especially when it's not nice numbers, like if it were 50%, oh, that's easy enough to draw because it's half of the circle. If it were 25%, okay, it's a quarter of a circle. I can kind of make certain percentages easier than if, let's say these numbers were a little bit messier, like maybe this was 47%. Well, how do I really, you know, parse out 47%? It's doable, but then it requires, okay, I gotta get a protractor, I gotta measure the angle, and you can kind of see the downside to using that chart. So these are the things to kind of keep in mind when you're thinking about how to represent data. So pie charts, first, we will, we'll just say it's difficult to make. And we'll say accurate. Not that it's hard, to actually just do, but it's just difficult to make it accurate as a picture, okay? The other thing to remember about a pie chart is we need to have the whole data. So, and by that, what I mean is if you look at what we're measuring, we're saying the final grades of juniors, there's only five possibilities. That's everything that could possibly happen. If we were to, let's say, take the senior class, and instead of asking for the final grades of juniors, we would say, okay, I'm going to say favorite color, okay? Then a pie chart may not be the best measurement. And now why would that be? So let's say I change this up and I say, okay, I'm gonna measure favorite color. Now, if I just went up to a senior and I said, hey, what's your favorite color? They could give me any possible color. So maybe some kids will say red, some kids will say blue, some kids will say green, some kids will say puce, you know, some kids will say magenta. Uh, there's an infinite amount of uh, different colors that they could say. So if I were to try to make a pie chart of that, will I have stated every single color that could possibly exist? Because maybe some kid didn't, None of the seniors will ever say purple. Okay, but purple's a color. Where is it in the pie chart? Are we missing something? Or is one color so close to another that they could possibly be the same? So unless we go in, so this is part of collecting data that we'll see later on in the chapter. If we wanted to make a pie chart based on favorite color, I would have to approach a senior and say, which of the following is your favorite color? So if I prescribed certain colors and I said, okay, you can only pick from red, blue, uh, green, and yellow. Then we can make a pie chart because then, okay, the seniors can only pick this. There isn't a fifth option. They can't do a write-in option. But if I don't prescribe choices, then a pie chart is not necessarily going to be the best choice. It's going to be deceptive in trying to make a circle graph saying this is everything. Because when we make that circle graph, we're saying this is the end, these are all the possible choices. So if we were to make, let's say, if I were to go over and say, hey, favorite color, but I don't prescribe choices for the seniors, they just kind of rattle off a color that they like, then a bar graph might be a better uh, representation. So those you might be familiar with. So a bar graph, there's two axes. So the vertical axes will usually represent your counts, or you might show it as a percentage. And then on the uh, horizontal axis would be your categories. So in this case, all the different colors. So this is why in a bar graph, it's better than the pie chart if we don't have 
uh, prescribed choices because, okay, they, maybe I have 10, 11, 12 different choices. I can just keep writing down here all the choices that could ever come up. But if I had a pie chart, how do I know that there aren't other ones? Because if not, as soon as I close off the circle, then that's it. Those are the only choices that are available. Now, there's a couple things to keep in mind about bar graphs. When you make a bar graph, the widths of the bars are the same. They have to stay the same, okay? Secondly, the bars don't touch. And that's gonna become later uh, later on important when we start talking about quantitative data. So if I were to collect information, so the different colors, so I would make sure that all the bars are exactly the same width and they don't touch, okay? So I might have something like so. And since this is categorical data, you can arrange the bars in whatever order you want. So maybe this bar represents the number of students that like red, this one represents blue, this represents green, this represents yellow, and so on. So the bars all have the same width and they don't touch. If they were to touch, the reason why we don't want them to touch is if they were to touch, then that would make it look like in some way, the blue transitions into the green, okay? Like, oh, there's, it goes from here to here. If they touched, then that kind of implies, well, then there's uh, between this number and that number uh, were the number of people that like blue-green. No, because these bars can be ordered in whichever order we want to put them in. So that's why we don't want the bars to touch. The widths of the bars need to remain the same because if we were to make the bars of varying widths, then it makes it deceptive in terms of the area because our eyes will look at the graph and go, well, that's a bigger space than this other bar, so that must mean that there's more things there. So, for example, if I were to make this red bar, let's say it looked like that. Now, when you look at this graph, even though I'm measuring is like the counts, this has a lower count than the other bars, the fact that this bar is twice as wide draws my attention to it and I would kind of lean towards being influenced that red for some reason is more because we are nat you know by nature we're visual creatures so we would look at that I would be less inclined to kind of read well what does the vertical axis mean I would just look and go big bar must be more no it's only the vertical nothing about the horizontal is is making any difference because in the horizontal we're just measuring is categories okay now as we so this really is the difference between bar graphs and pie charts so there's pros and cons to each one and when you'll want to use it so that does it for this first part in chapter one and in looking at categorical data